Um, project updates uh, as of as far as I can today. Um, there's going to be a few things in here that are repeat content for folks that have seen this or a similar presentation in the past, but uh, we will move through, maybe even try to catch you up some time, Randy. Uh, okay. <laughs> Background and project overview. Are we doing good? No, we lost the presenter view. I got this one. How are we doing? All right. So, tuck that over there. Um, project purpose, right? Klamath Dam Removal Project. Or, uh, the purpose is fish passage, right? We're removing four hydroelectric facilities on the Klamath River. Uh, Iron Gate Dam, Copco 2, Copco 1, and J.C. Boyle moving in the upstream direction. Um, the idea there, single mission, restore fish passage, improve water quality uh, by decommissioning these facilities. I've got some photographs up on the screen for the different facilities. Copco 1 is the oldest dam, uh, been around for about 100 years. Construction of Copco 2 followed shortly on the heels of Copco 1. Uh, J.C. Boyle took place a little later in the 1900s, 1950s-ish, and Iron Gate was completed in the 60s um, as a conservation dam. So uh, in a nutshell, you had, with the construction of Copco 1 Dam, anadromous uh, or anadromy was halted kind of, oh, what are we, maybe 20 miles, or sorry, about 10 miles upstream of I-5. Uh, with the construction of Copco number one, moved a little further down with Copco number two, and now Anadromy stops at Iron Gate Dam, which is a little closer to, to eight miles upstream from um, I-5. Scope of river renewal efforts, um, working to develop collaborative solutions. So KRC, the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, is the entity that is responsible for dam removal. They, KRC is my client on the project. Um, first step to restoring a river that has a dam on it, right? If you want fish passage past the dam, you want to restore a river, remove the dam. Um, communities then will continue to take other steps towards shared sustainable future for the Klamath Basin, right? And that's what a lot of what this group is focused on, is evaluating the river and its tributaries for what the next steps are. Uh, 400 plus miles of anadromy opened up by removal of the dams and uh, hopefully a reversal of some pretty adverse water quality conditions um, with fish disease in the lower river. Um, improving water quality, some other benefits, right? Other than fish passes, we're including water quality. Um, cooler temperatures should increase dissolved oxygen and we get rid of this nasty, stinky, toxic algae that blooms in the reservoirs. Um, so key regulatory accomplishments. Uh, FERC, FERC issued the joint license transfer in June of 2021, effectively transferring the license for the hydropower facilities from uh, Pacific or two KRC in the states of California and Oregon. Okay, the license surrender order came in 2022. Um, the license, so the license was transferred. The surrender order was the step that said, hey, you do these things and you implement these management plans, uh, meet all these permit terms and conditions and we will allow you to surrender the license. When a license is surrendered, it is no more, it goes away. Uh, hydropower is no longer produced, water is no longer impounded, nothing is there. Oh, I won't say nothing, but there's nothing there to block fish passage anymore and no reason for a FERC license. Uh, the states and KRC accepted the transfer order, became official co-licensees in December of 2022. Overview of the project schedule. Uh, design development for at least dam removal is complete and uh, the regulatory approval acquisition is I'd say about 99% there. There are still a few local permits that uh, Kiwit and Res are working through with the cooperation of some of the other contractors on the KRC team. Pre-drawdown year activities, that is this year, 2023, where um, I'll talk a little bit more about what exactly those activities are, but clearly there on the slide, activities conducted prior to the drawdown year. Drawdown year is next year on or around uh, the 1st of January. Water will be, uh, let's see, uh, I think I'll talk a little bit more specifics on how it's going to be done, but uh, the dams at J.C. Boyle, Copco, and Iron Gate are open for the final time uh, and not closed back down. Uh, and then dam removal begins, power generation facility removal begins uh, in earnest, and then post-drawdown year activities 
are pretty much, that's my scope of work with the restoration, monitoring and adaptive management of the reservoir footprints and other disturbed areas. Estimated construction timeline. Okay, so this year, roadway and infrastructure improvements, uh, recreation area removals, the rec sites were uh, official, or most of the rec sites on Iron Gate and Copco were officially closed this past Friday. And so uh, activity is now very visible within the project footprint on um, those sites going away and the reservoir soon to follow. Uh, fire management improvements being done. The Copco number one access and dam modifications have been underway for a little over a month where, um, you know, when they built Copco one, Copco one dam was built with mules and localized rail lines powered by people pushing rail carts, right? Uh, and so you can imagine if you needed to get down a canyon, down into a canyon with a mule team, you don't need a road that's too terribly wide. Well, to get down and out of the, and back up out of the canyon with really big dump trucks, you need bigger roads. So what Kiewit has been doing is working on widening the access down from the top of the canyon down to the Copco one and two dams. Uh, Iron Gate tunnel improvements, the, the outlet tunnel or low level outlet for Iron Gate Dam is an unlined rock tunnel. And um, that's not really meant to operate under high head pressures or high water pressures. And so what's being done this summer is a reinforced concrete coating of that tunnel lining or an introduction of tunnel lining so that it can support uh, and, and maintain integrity during the release flows. Um, there's not a whole lot needing to be done at J.C. Boyle for drawdown, and that's why it's kind of bumped out here later in the year. Uh, really, it's a matter of making sure the roads are there, the gates are there, the signs are up that close the access roads, and there's about a week of actual prep work at the dam to be ready to, to uh, blow some plugs in the old outlet works or the, the diversion tunnels at that dam. You can see monitoring and adaptive management extends a pretty long time. Uh, what do we got here for colors? Reservoir drawdown is blue. So Boyle, uh, Copco One, and Iron Gate all happen kind of simultaneously. Looks like our timeline needs to shift maybe just a little bit. But this is the kind of really the exciting part. Copco number two dam actually comes out this year for those who maybe hadn't heard this yet. Um, Copco two dam is the smallest of the dams. And uh, part of the, the preparation work for Copco number one to get it ready for drawdown is the drilling of a sizable tunnel through the base of the dam. Well, in order to safely do that, he shut down flows between, you can, we, we can manage flows between Iron Gate and Copco to allow a drying of the river reach downstream of Copco. So there's no water moving from Copco Dam into Iron Gate Reservoir. F environmental flows are still being released out of Iron Gate Dam. And given the current flow conditions in the basin, things fairly wet winter had quite a good amount of flow, uh, can, later in the summer to early fall can really shut down Copco for about eh, five to seven days at a time before you have to let the water back out of Copco to refill Iron Gate. And so the, there was already gonna be this flow trading to allow the safe access to the base of Copco One Dam uh, for the drilling of the adit, but also safe access to the tunnel and Iron Gate to line it. And we all looked at it and said, well, why don't we take Copco Two out at the same time? And so Copco 2 Dam and um, other facilities, so the powerhouse, the penstock and things like that, most of that, that those facilities are gonna be removed this year, um, starting here in about three weeks um, with full dam removal of Copco 2 at about, uh, what are we looking at? October, mid-October, Copco 2's out. Um, we have drawdown, we have facility removal, we have dam removal, channel restoration, and then this stuff, you know, the most exciting part, reservoir and tributary restoration. A uh, little more details uh, on what's been going on. 2023, what's happened? Uh, mobilizing and setting up offices and construction laydown. Both Kiwit and Res have now set up field offices. Kiwit's facilities are up a little closer to Copco 2. Uh, powerhouse hours are a little downriver we uh, acquired the old Fish Hook restaurant and associated property right beside the Blue Heron, and we have our base of operations there. Road improvements are underway uh, at Copco. They are fixing to start repaving Copco Road between the Klamathon Bridge and uh, the project site. In about a week, I believe, they were out painting work areas today, so we're getting close. 
Road's in rough shape. We're all ready for that thing to get fixed back up. Um, June, August is still the right time frame for installation of this arch culvert that's replacing a uh, culvert at Fall Creek where Daggett Road crosses because the current bridge is not beefy enough to handle the heavy construction loads. And once reservoir is drawn down, there'll be no fish passage. So instead of just shoring up the existing crossing, said, hey, take out the whole thing, knock out construction access and fish passage at the same time, uh, which is ridiculously important because the hatchery is being constructed not too far just upstream from there. So Daggett Road, this truss bridge, which this is an example of what the bridge looks like, it's currently being constructed just on the, this is the actual Daggett Road uh, crossing of the Klamath River at the upper end of Iron Gate. And gosh, I apologize to the folks on the call. I've been pointing with my, my pointer. So this is Daggett Road Bridge. And the new bridge is being constructed just upstream uh, of the existing Daggett Road Bridge. I'd say they're probably getting close to getting that truss section across the river. It was almost there last week. It's what happens is it's, uh, it's put together on the, what are we looking at? The right bank and loads come in, maybe four or five loads a day of bridge material come in. It's kind of a prefab modular system. You slap it together and you push it out a little bit further over the river and then add some more pieces and push it a little bit farther. It's been pretty neat to watch. But it's almost done. This water line work is going to happen uh, following that bridge placement because the new water line to the city of Wairika is going to be, it currently sits on the bed of the lake just downstream of the existing Daggett Bridge. Uh, it's going to get moved and suspended from the new bridge uh, once that thing gets put up. We've got wreck facilities starting to be removed now. Uh, that'll run through about August. Uh, the tunnel at the base of Copco 1 Dam I mentioned is going to go in. The Copco 2 Dam removal starts in a couple of weeks. And then these low-level outlet tunnel improvements at Iron Gate begin in earnest in the summer. Uh, these are just some, some drawings that show the improvements to the access roads uh, to Copco 1 and 2. Uh, removal of some on-site uh, old housing that was here. Uh, those were taken out. This is just a more detailed view of, of Copco 2 Dam. Uh, this is kind of a, a schematic of what Copco 2 Dam removal looks like. Um, Iron Gate Dam here on, with downstream kind of being on the right side of the photo or the image. Copco Reservoir being on the left. The dam gets removed through drilling and blasting. And then uh, the channel footprint through that dam uh, footprint gets restored this year. Oh, hey, look at this. So drawing water, this wasn't my presentation. I'm doing my best here. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. So wow, okay, let's watch it again. How do I watch it again? Let's do this. All right, Copco goes up, Iron Gate goes down, and that happens, like I mentioned, a handful of times over a couple of weeks, and this is probably a six to eight week period, the Copco 1 dam gets removed to a certain extent, and then um, Copco 2, or the river gets turned back loose through the bypass reach here at um, Copco 2, or the, by the Wards Canyon reach, which is gonna be super cool. Um, tunnel, right? So work pad is constructed downstream of Copco at the base of the dam. This is kind of what happens in June. Uh, they're in there then in step number two, excavating that tunnel through the base of the dam. There's a pipe, 10 foot, this is diameter, uh, not length. Diameter pipe gets run through that work pad and then covered with spillway apron material. Uh, because what's going to happen here is after, as the water is shunted through this tunnel, after that, they'll be able to open up the historic uh, low flow bypass tunnel that's on the left abutment of Copco. And as they begin taking down the dam in about 10 foot chunks, they'll push the material down onto the spillway apron, at which point they'll pick it up with dump trucks and excavators and loaders and haul it back up to the disposal site towards the top of the hill. Okay, so uh, sucker salvage, give an update on sucker salvage. It is currently underway. Uh, this is a, a, a endangered species management activity mandated by biops and management plans uh, and also uh, 401 water quality certifications in both states, California and Oregon. Uh, 
Uh, Iron Gate salvage took place on April 20th, well, 20th and 21st. We caught a total of seven suckers, which was disheartening to say the least. Um, th things really picked up then on Copco Lake. So we had crews go out, we caught seven suckers, only four of them were the right species to be transferred. In two nights at Iron Gate, at Copco, uh, we caught 120 fish on the first night. So, uh, which matches what was seen during the population assessments that were done back in 2018, 2019. And so we've got kind of our numbers here with a total of 141 boat hours over three boats, 25 folks, uh, 189 net sets, 282 total suckers captured. Uh, of those 282, 182 were short nose suckers, uh, 92 Klamath large scale, seven Klamath small scale, one Lost River. Uh, so 183 suckers were transferred from the facilities or from the Copco and Iron Gate facilities to the lower Klamath National Wildlife Refuge by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, J.C. Boyle is currently underway, and yesterday we transported 50 suckers from J.C. Boyle to the Klamath Tribes rearing facility up in Chiloquin. Uh, some upcoming tasks for RES this year are Ward's Canyon Hazard Tree Removal Program. Um, we've got a, uh, a requirement in the EIS and therefore in the license surrender order that hazard trees be removed from the bypass reach between Copco 2 Dam and Copco 2 Powerhouse. Those activities will begin simultaneously with the Copco uh, 2 Dam removal uh, and prep work at Copco 1. So here in June, crews are first going to get into the, our crews will first be in the river doing some of this prep work to get those trees out uh, of the river channel. And I guess a, a better description of that is water from Copco 2 Dam is pushed through a penstock that runs through the mountainside down to the Copco 2 powerhouse. And there's about a two mile reach of the Klamath River that's been effectively cut off from naturalized flows since Copco 2 Dam was constructed nearly 100 years ago. Alder trees, some of them, I think the biggest one was pushing 40 inches in diameter at breast height, are growing in the river channel. And it was determined that those uh, trees would cause a significant enough hazard to recreational boaters that the request was made and then the requirement uh, put in the, the permit conditions that those trees go through and be removed. Uh, IEV management, invasive exotic vegetation management and seed collection, uh, IEV management's currently happening along Copco Road and some uh, other reservoir rim locations. Seed collection will pick up here in a couple weeks as some of the more our target species begin to seed again. Uh, boulder splitting, same thing. Fish pass, or sorry, boulder passage concerns in what's the J.C. Boyle by bypass reach. So the reach of river between J.C. Boyle Dam and J.C. Boyle Powerhouse gets flow, but not a naturalized amount of flow. And what was it, Mike? 10-ish years ago, uh, there was a rock slide that took out a part of the power canal uh, and all the rocks ended up in the river. They split, rocks were split for fish passage, but now there's a concern that they weren't split enough for boat passage. And so we'll get out there, we'll split rocks, um, small enough that the boats can get past. Also, <laughs> meanwhile, not creating a new fish passage impediment. Uh, and then large wood tree harvest, we're placing, we res for restoration, are placing around a thousand whole trees within the reservoir footprints focused on some of our high priority tributary restoration areas. We're starting harvest of that this fall where excavators will go out onto tree, tree property in Oregon, uh, dig out root wads, lay trees over, and those trees will then sit there until about this time next year when they will be flown from the harvest sites the seven to eight miles to the, the reservoir area uh, restoration sites next year following drawdown. Uh, so 2024, so this is a little bit of a look ahead. We've got Copco One Reservoir drawdown and dam removal. Uh, this tunnel is, is drilled through the base of Copco One to a distance of about 10 feet up or downstream, leaving a 10 foot plug in the tunnel. And um, that tunnel will be blasted which will allow that Copco One Reservoir to drain through the attic. Um, and then the dam will be removed, drilling and blasting, to mention about 10 foot shots, uh, with looks like new channel be completed by October, 2024. So getting the dam down, that dam actually has to be taken below the riverbed somewhat before it's brought back up. Um, refilled with some of the channel materials that were excavated during 
construction of the dam. Uh, so the powerhouse here will be removed kind of concurrently with COPCO-1 dam removal, uh, and those include the power generation equipment, the entire powerhouse, and all these other buildings and appurtenances. Uh, JC Bull is fairly straightforward. These existing diversion tunnels are there in place. They're blocked right now with concrete stop logs. The concrete stop log in one tunnel, uh, the, the right tunnel, will get blasted first. Reservoir draws down some. Once it's safe to enter, the crews will go in and open up the second stop log or open up the second tunnel, and then we've got 100% of flows flowing through uh, those bypass tunnels. Um, what's that? Once the reservoir is drawn down, um, there'll be a, a re, um, re-establishment of a coffer dam that was there that was used to build the dam. So the coffer dam will be re-established, shunt the water through these bypass um, LOFO outlets, and then the earthen portion of the dam will be removed and will be disposed of on site. Uh, here's a picture of a bunch of other facilities. The concrete power canal, which runs about two miles from J.C. Boyle Dam, you can see here the intake pipe, it's I think 14 feet in diameter, um, runs into the upper end of that power canal. That power canal then runs two miles down the side of the canyon. To this point here, uh, that whole thing gets kind of collapsed and filled back on itself. This large scour hole, the scour hole was formed by, um, if something happens at the, the power plant, flow is moving here from uh, kind of where my clicker's at now to the left, and then goes through a tunnel in the mountain. If anything happens to the power plant um, and it needs to kind of go through an emergency shutdown process, there's a few gates here that close. All these gates here on this outlet diversion uh, spillway open to allow the water and the head that's built up by that water to dissipate down into the scour hole. It's a really big hole in the mountainside. And the majority of the, the dam embankment material that doesn't get used to fill the power canal will get put to try to blend this uh, scour hole back into the hillside to the extent possible. And then of course, the rest of the penstocks, the powerhouse and the buildings that go along with that dam are gonna be removed. Uh, Iron Gate dam removal drawdown happens through this existing diversion tunnel. Like I mentioned, it'll be lined and reinforced this year. Uh, following drawdown, which we're looking at May, June of 24, the excavators and trucks will just start chewing away um, at the top. And for um, for reference, there's about a hundred or a million cubic yards of material within that dam. Uh, that material, some will be used to fill this concrete spillway. Some will be used to fill uh, these voids left when the power generation facility is removed. The rest of it will go back into the borrow pit where that material came from originally uh, and kind of rebuild the top of the mountain that was taken down through construction of the dam. And then, yep. Grading to be uh, completed by October 2024. There'll be quite a bit of transmission and distribution line removal going, taking place. Pacific Core is doing some, uh, Keywood is doing others, and then a lot of these switch yards that you see here will disappear also over time. Post drawdown years, uh, moving forward, restoration. So kind of my, my big piece of the project, we actually start with drawdown. Reseeding of the reservoir footprints begins in 2024, kind of immediately following drawdown so we can get seed on wet soil uh, or reservoir sediment. And that continues on through 2025. So we're planting, we're placing wood in 2024. Uh, we're still treating IEV. We're probably still collecting seeds. And then in 2025, we're going to see how the everything fared over the first winter. We'll put some more trees down. We'll start doing our yellow iron uh, construction of channel restoration at priority tribs. Uh, once that's done kind of later in the year in 2025, then we're just kind of monitoring, maintaining, performing adaptive management as needed. We monitor water quality in both states through the end of 2026, um, guarantee tributary connectivity downstream of Iron Gate Dam and at Shovel Creek through the end of 25. Uh, there's some other tributary and fish passage obligations that we hold through, I believe, 2027 or 2028, where we're mandated to make sure the river is passable by fish along its length. Now, from uh, the Copco, or sorry, the Cottonwood Creek confluence, which is down near Hornbrook, all the way up through the upper end of J.C. Boyle. That's it.
And this is the upper basin. So this is a, a Reach River that's upstream of the project area uh, in the Keno vicinity. And so I will happily answer questions that anyone has. Dave. Mike's got a question. Nope. Um, here, wait. Let's start with Josh here since he's right next to the mic. Hey, thanks for the update, Dave. Mm -hmm. I was curious as to why water quality monitoring is stopping in 2026, but restoration monitoring continues through 30. So the water quality, the duration of water quality monitoring was mandated by the states, and it was kind of a, a minimum amount of water quality monitoring. It may be extended, but right now that minimum amount of water quality monitoring goes through 26. And that's, that's what the project has funding for. And if more monitoring is required, the states will say it's required and then find funding um, to help implement it. I expect it will continue at a certain level, but I don't know what level that will be. Um, Dave, my neighbor's a qu heavy equipment operator, and I asked him, are you going to be working on the dams? And he said the union told him right now they hit some artifacts and they've kind of been shut down. Is there some truth to that? Uh, yes and no. I'll say that. Yes and no. Um, this is a very culturally rich area, right? And uh, this place, this, this area is different from where I'm used to working in Texas, where I've done the bulk of my career, where the artifacts are buried usually for anywhere from three to 20 feet when we're working along some old river systems. Um, here, everything's at the surface. And there are areas that weren't previously mapped that have been found. Um, work stops in that location and moves to a new one is kind of how, and at Kiwit operates similarly to the way we do when there's something, anything, whether it's a, a turtle or a, you know some other species limitation or just kind of, we call them environmentally sensitive uh, occurrences. If there's one here, all right, we're going to stop working over here and we're going to go continue working over here. So now work's not shut down. Uh, it's just a, but yes, I, I, I will say that there are cultural resources out there that do uh, slow down work in some areas, but just speed work up in other areas. So. Are the recreational flows downstream of J.C. Boyle going to continue the summer? They continue this summer with the exception of... Um, I think there's some interruption in that September, October timeframe, sound right? Um, when, when the flow swaps are happening for COPCO2. But the reason that the flow swaps and the dam removal of COPCO2 happens now uh, later in the year is to uh, maintain those, or those recreational flows for as long as possible during the boating season. Cool. Um, one quick question here. With the way you're pulsing water out of Copco and Iron Gate and pausing it for periods of time, do you expect water temperature problem, uh, changes downstream of Iron Gate because of that as you draw down the thermocline? There, this is again, my understanding was there is at a point you start to negatively affect temperature downriver. And that's why the, sh the flow swaps occur um, starting September, but have to end mid-October. And we can't take them any longer than that is because after that, we start seeing some negative impacts to water temperature downstream. Do you know if there's any uh, meaningful discussion happening about land back opportunities with the land that's going to be now on the surface that was buried in the underwater in the dams? They are taking place. Mm -hmm. KRC is having those conversations. I don't know much about them. I just know that they're happening. Thank you for the presentation. It's awesome to see all this work happening. Really exciting. Um, I'm doing a study that's considering some of the social impacts that flow from, you know, the dam removal and including the infrastructure removal. And, um, you know, just looking back to 2010 agreements, there was this giant economic analysis of like all the jobs that might flow into the community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious to hear what's, the strategy around engaging um, tribal folks, local folks, and some of the infrastructure jobs. How's that going? Sure. How do you guys set people up to, to access that? Sure. So I can't speak for Kiwit uh, okay. because I'm not them. Um, I do know that for Res, we have a very high level of tribal participation on the project. We've, uh, we have the Yurok tribe as a uh, preferred provider on restoration. They've been doing all of our work on seed collection and invasive exotic vegetation management up to this point. Um, we're about to kick off. They're going to be helping us with that work in Wards Canyon and a few other places over the summer. So we have a, a very high level of tribal involvement. Uh, and then we're, we're making a big push to hire locally also. So we've got one, two, 
I'd say of my team of eight folks, uh, four were are local. Uh, the others were recent graduates from across the country and have moved and now live locally uh, and plan to be there for the duration of the projects. And then we're uh, working on spending all our money in, in um, Jackson, Klamath, and um, Siskiyou County. Um, there's one question on the line from Chauncey Anderson, um, and I think it's similar to mine about the sequencing, sure. uh, but it has more to do about the timing of sediment releases and water quality changes. Um, any uh, kind of thoughts on kind of the sediment side of it in terms of if that will, the sequencing will affect sediment? It will not, it should not this year because the, the water's still coming from the upper levels of the reservoir pools, right? So no sediment should be mobilized. There'd be a little bit, I would think, uh, during the COPCO2 removal, all, all or, well, say, can't say all, most of which, but close to all would be attenuated in the Iron Gate Reservoir this year. Okay. All right. And Dave, and then might have to move on after that. I don't know if you can answer this or not. A lot of dams that were built before the 1940s suffer from alkali silica reaction, which weakens the concrete. Did you get a chance to analyze these dams to see if that's a problem with them and makes removal easier, but safety worse in terms of if they stayed in place? I cannot answer that question because I was not involved in the evaluation of the dams. Okay. Um, how much dynamite are you using? Yeah, great question. Next time we'll get Mark to come give the presentation. He can probably answer both those questions. Okay. Yeah. Because we could have got this done 20 years ago, right. you know, with just <laughs> one 500th of the budget with enough dynamite. So. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, complex project. It is oh, a very complex God. project. Yeah. But yeah. Um, thanks for the update. Really helpful yeah. to hear that. And sure, everyone got a lot out of that. So very good. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.